Alright, so this may be the last uh, recording of the entire summer session because I want to explain the answer of the test of the final assessment. I don't know how you want to call it. Is it an exam? Is it a project? I don't know exactly how to call it. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, we can start with main. Okay, I think it's better to start with main. So main is over here. This is the entry point of the code because we can see on line 4 we're going to main first. Alright, so once we get to main uh, there are a few definitions. The macro definition buff length is 9, so I define a label of the same name. <coughs> the local variable buffer is also called buffer and it also has an offset of 0 because that is where the stack pointer should be pointing to once I have allocated for um, the local variable of main. And that's the only thing in the frame of main because main is not called from anyone else so it has no parameters and it also has no return address. So local variables are the only thing in main's frame. Um, and not surprisingly, you know, the uh, amount of the number of bytes used by local variables of main is really the same thing as just buff length because you know it just uses those nine bytes for local variables, which is uh, over here in the C code. So when once we allocate everything in C, the way we um, deal with function G is we don't do it first. We have to uh, perform function F first. However, because we have to push the arguments backwards, so we do have to push one first. And that is done, okay, pushing one on the stack is done by lines 126 to line 128. Okay, so we can start to comment some code here. Okay, so this is pushing one on stack as argument to function g, not to function f, it's for function g. Now the important part here is everything is now off, one byte off from the label because now we got that one extra thing on the stack so it's helpful to say you know we got one extra byte on stack now remember to offset this. Okay. Um, the second thing we have to push on the stack is the result of calling f. Now in order to get to the result of calling f, we have to call f first. So in order to call f, we have to first push the address of the literal string on the stack. And this was illustrated by one of the sample programs that I did before. I think it has to do with string length and string copy. Um, so that's basically how we do it on lines 131 to line 133. So this is for pushing 87, which is a literal string on stack. Uh, and this is argument to function f. And then we have to push this constant 0 on the stack as well. And that is done by lines 134 to line 36. So if I were to summarize, this is pushing 0, which is also argument to f. If you want to count the arguments, this is argument 2 to f. And this one here is argument 1 to f. If we start counting from 0, but if you want to count from 0, then, uh, excuse me, if we count from 1, but if we want to count from 0, then we have 0 as argument 0 and the string, literal string, as argument 1 to push to the stack. So once we push the two arguments to function f, then we can go ahead and call f. That is done by lines 137 to line 140. So this is you new know, to call or invoke. Uh, function f. When f returns the first thing we need to do, the immediate thing we have to do is to deallocate the arguments. Okay, so we deallocate arguments <clears throat> and then we immediately push the return value on the stack. Push return value of f of 0, 87 on the stack because if we don't push it is not going to be on the stack, it's just going to be in register A but because the return value of f is supposed to be um, the second argument to call g, so that means we have to push it on the stack. So this part is kind of important. So we also have to remember now, oops, uh, right here. So we have to remember at this point that we got two things extra on the, on the stack. So we got two 
extra bytes on stack now remember to offset this okay so this is when we have to push buffer on the stack which is a local variable and the label is assuming that we do not have any extra bytes to push on the stack so in order to push those two extra uh, in, to account for to those two extra bytes so we need uh, buffer 2 plus instead of just buffer there are other ways to do this too um, if I were to just load uh, buffer into C I could increment C twice after the LDI instruction, so I would accept that as a correct answer as well. But the easiest way to do it is simply to add a 2 plus after the label. After all, this is what I taught, how I taught it in class. So by the time we get here, we would have pushed a buffer on stack as well. <clears throat> and then from here, uh, from line 152 to line 155, this is calling f. After f returns, we have to deallocate its uh, arguments. So we deallocate uh, arguments to f. And at that point, there's nothing else to do. So I just uh, readjust the stack to deallocate by deallocating the local variable of main. And then we get to the halt instruction on line 162. So that's from main's perspective. Now we can go back to uh, the subroutines. Let's go to subroutine F first. Okay, so in the C code, we just go back to subroutine F. So we go to subroutine F here. If you're not used to recursive subroutines, um, you can always uh, debug this program in C first um, and just to observe you know, what it does, okay? and there are many ways to do it. You know, GDB is one way, and you can single step. You can do a next. You can print out the arguments. It's it's doing this. You can even convert the program to one that does not use uh, a single recursive call line, and you know, in in the return statement. Okay, so when we are looking at the C code, the first thing we need to do with a ternary expression is to evaluate the condition, which is what P is pointing to. So if I were to comment on each line, what uh, each register has at this point, so C has the offset from D to parameter P at this point, because P is defined to be uh, just the offset. And these definitions, by the way, are correct as well. So now, if I add uh, register D or the value of register D to the offset, then I get the actual address. So C is now the actual address of P. Now C is the value of P. And one more dereference, but into a different register, B is now whatever P is pointing to. And that is what we need to decide whether we want to go to the then expression or the else expression. So we do an and PP, okay? So we are basically testing uh, whatever P is pointing to. And if it is a zero, okay, if not uh, star p, then we go to the else case, okay? So the else case is corresponding to just returning x. So if we do continue here, okay, this is the then value of the ternary expression, okay? So the, the ternary expression, you know, is recursive. The first thing we do is we want to push p plus one on stack. So we look up all the registers to see who has what, and we can see that register C still has the value of uh, parameter P itself. So by incrementing C, C is now P plus 1, and then we push it on the stack. So we push P plus 1 on the stack this way. And then the next thing we need to do is a little bit complex, okay? There's a little bit of calculation to do. Um, because register B, uh, which is all the way up here, okay? And the and BB instruction doesn't really change the value of B. So register B really still has the value of the byte that P is pointing to. So in that case, I can perform um, asterisk P minus 48 first. So um, obviously this means you know, C is now 48. And then we do the subtraction, which means B is now uh, whatever P is pointing to, minus 48, which is the ASCII code of zero. So I'm basically looking at a character, 
and convert it back to uh, the value of the digit of that particular character. So that is now stored in B, and then we, because we have pushed P plus 1 already on the stack, so it is necessary to do the 1 plus when we access X. So C is actually just the offset to from D to X. <clears throat> Um, but the, the, um, I, let's see here. Yes, it is. It is the offset from D to X, but this time the uh, the value I have to load into it is X1 plus because we have this extra byte that is now pushed on the stack. This is the extra byte on the stack that requires the 1 plus over here. Um, and then we add the stack pointer to C, so it's no longer just the offset. C is now the actual is now the actual address of X and then we dereference it, which means C is now just the value of X. So now uh, I make a copy, so the A is also the value of X. <clears throat> At C, C is doubling the value, so C is now you know, 2 times X, or X times 2. I double again, C is now X times 4, and I double again, <clears throat> C is now X times 8. So C is only a, C is C is done at this point. I do need A to double as well. So A was originally the value of X. So by doubling it only once, A is now uh, X times two, and then I just add everything together. So register C. You just look up whatever register C was. Uh, register C was uh, X oh, right here. It's X times eight. But since I'm adding B to it, so it's X times 8 plus um, asterisk B minus 48 at this point. But I'm also adding register A to it. So register C is now whatever you had, okay, which is X times 8 plus whatever, whatever P is pointing to minus 48, also plus X times 2, because that's what is in register A by the time we get to the last add instruction. <clears throat> then we decrement D, and then we push C on the stack. So these two instructions together is really pushing you know, this long expression, which is exactly this part over here, even though the ordering is a little bit different. But since multiplication is commutative, it is equivalent to whatever the C code has. There we go. So we push it on the stack. And I hope nobody made an extra correction here, because this code is actually correct. Um, because I usually I use a decrement D first and then we load uh, LD, uh, we LDI whatever register with dot five plus. So in that case dot five plus is correct because decrement D is not a part of the offset from where the LDI is to the JMP to the instruction right after the JMPI instruction. But in this case I intentionally flip the order. Uh, but instead of using a dot five plus, I use a dot six plus. This is actually still correct. Okay, so C is still the address of the of the instruction right after JMPI instruction. So it's really the address of the uh, the first increment D instruction, and I push it on the stack. So by the time I push on the stack, this is really the return address pushed on the stack. So this is the call to this is the recursive call to function f, and when f returns, okay. So when this value of f returns, there's nothing to do except to deallocate the arguments um, because we are using that return value to as my own return value. So we have to deallocate the two arguments. And we're done. We just jump to F return, which has nothing to do except to uh, just getting back to my own caller. Now, what about the else case? The else case, in the else case, I need to get the value of X into register A, which is exactly what is being done here. So register A has the offset to X. And now register A has the address of X. And now register A has the value of x. So that's how f is implemented. Um, it looks kind of ugly, but if you just kind of approach it step by step and try to uh, match the code to what the C code is doing, then you'll be able to 
um, kind of isolate you know what each part is trying to do and you know whether there, it has a problem or not so now we move on to function G and in the C code function G looks a little bit longer I could have done function G kind of the same way, you know, using a super long re single return statement, but I decided to kind of make it longer in this case. So this way it is uh, it's actually easier to for us to keep track of what is happening. So uh, the offsets, by the way, first of all, are all correct. Um, the return address, because there are no local variables, so the stack pointer does point to the return address uh, at the entry point of, of function G. And then one byte on top of that is Q, which is the same thing as uh, P. I cannot use P in both functions because uh, labels are global in the assembler. So I have to use Q for that purpose. So, you know, even though I use a different name, okay, by the offset, you know, you can tell what it is um, corresponding to what the argument is in the C code. V is on top of that and then M is on top of that. So now we have PVM, SQVM on the assembly language side. Only one person kind of asked me to ask me to confirm that um, Q as a label is actually corresponding to P as a parameter. It's okay to ask for you know, confirmation that they are really the same thing. But you know, from how it is used, you know, we can tell that they are actually the same thing. All right, so now we move on to the conditional statement. In order to perform this conditional statement, we have to see whether M is exactly 80 in hexadecimal. So obviously this means that you kind of have to remember how to do uh, base conversion because without knowing how to do base conversion, then you would not be able to enter the value of 0x80, which is hexadecimal 80, as a decimal number. Okay, so the first thing we do is, okay, so let's check out you know, what each register has. C is the offset to M. C is now the address of M. C is now the value of M. And this is for testing um, M to see whether it, it is. And this is the tricky part. The tricky part is um, if C is 80, then it is going to uh, the sign because the the one bit that is set in 80 in hexadecimal is bit 7. So by testing the sign bit, it is also known as the sign bit because it's also the most significant bit. So by testing the sign bit, I'm actually testing whether M has the most significant bit set or not. Then you might say, it, it doesn't guarantee that it's going to be 8-0 because it can be 8-1, can be 8-5, and so on. Well, that cannot happen because in the recursive call, we only add, uh, we only we only call uh, by doubling M. And we know that M from main starts with a 1. So we know that it's going to be 1, and then a 2, and then a 4, and then an 8, and then a 16, and then a 32, and so on. So uh, we know that it, if bit 7 is set, it has got to be just 8, 0. It cannot be anything else. So that's basically how we test or confirm that M is, in fact, 8, 0. Okay, so if that is the case, we go to the label called G then. Otherwise, we go to the else case. Now, the then statement in C actually has nothing to do. So when you look at the then, G then, okay, it really doesn't do a single thing. It just kind of falls right through to the continuing uh, label, which is you know dealing with whatever is after uh, the conditional statement. It is the else case that has something to do. So the else case is right here. I even put in the comment to let people know that, okay, this is where does else is beginning. So in the else case, we have to uh, first push M plus M. But by this time, we know M uh, register C still has a value of M. So by adding C to C, uh, register C is now M plus M, which is 2 times M or M times 2, you know, however, however you want to call that. <coughs> and then we push it on the stack. Okay, so we push M, whoops, we push M plus M on the stack, which is the third argument. And because we just push something on the stack, the offset to everything is now off by one. Okay, so offsets are now 
of by 1. And as a result, if we want to get to v, we have to load v1 plus into b, because that really is the offset to param uh, parameter v. And then we add the stack pointer to it, so the b is now the address of v. And then we do a LDBB, so the b is now the value of b. And then we push it on the stack. Okay, so now we push v on the stack. But this means your offsets are now off by 2. <clears throat> so by the time we get to P in the C code, which is Q in the assembly code, we have to compensate by 2 bytes, not just 1. So now we have to, uh, so C is now offset to Q, <clears throat> which is P in the C code. C is now the address of Q. And then register C is now the value of Q. And then we push that on the stack as well. So now we push oops, Q on the stack. Then we are ready to call the subroutine from lines 180. Uh, from line 80 to line 83, it is a call. So this is how we do the recursive call to G. Now, whether it's recursive or not really does not matter, OK? Because recursion is not special in any way. Um, other than the, if the algorithm is not specified correctly, it can, it can become an infinite recursion, which shoots up the stack and kill the program. But if you have a loop, okay, it can still be an infinite loop if you specify the condition incorrectly. So from that perspective, um, recursion really is not special in any way, because the way we um, clean up the stack after the recursion is the same way. Okay? Whether it's recursive or not, we, the caller has to clean up the arguments. Okay? So we have to say clean up the arguments. And obviously, um, G returns a value. So when it returns, we want to store the value into P, and that's what we are doing here. Okay, so we are. Uh, so if I were to comment here, because because we got the stack all cleaned up already, so the stack pointer is once again pointing to Q already. So there's no offset needed at this point on line 87 in the assembly code. So at this point, B is the offset to Q. And then by adding the stack pointer to it, B is now the address of Q. Now, then we have to increment A because register A is the return value of the call, the recursive call to G. Um, and we want to add one to it before we store to P. So I'm kind of combining these two lines into one so that you know, I can just uh, say, you know, let's not store into P first, then retrieve it from P, and then add one to it, and then store it back to P. So <coughs> register A is now G of P, V, M plus M plus 1, and then we store that back into P. So P is now G of P, V, M plus 1, M plus M, and then plus 1. And we got both of these lines done, you know, as a result. Then we jump to the continuation point, which is uh, really just getting uh, this line and the next one done. So let's see what the continuation point is going to do. All right, so the first thing we need to do is to look at the bitwise AND. This is a bitwise AND because it's a single ampersand, not double. So we look at the bitwise AND between V and M. And so we, what we do is we use one register for V. So A is offset to V. And now A is the address of V. And then A becomes the value of V. Same thing for B. So B is now the offset to M. B is now the address of M. And then B is now the value of M. So now we have to store you know, the result of the AND into one of the two registers. OK, it doesn't matter which one, you know, as long as we get it into one of the registers. So A is now um, V and M. OK, so let me put parentheses around this just so that it is extra clear. But it's also testing it at the same time. So the AND operation would also affect the, uh, the sign flag as well as the Z flag. That's basically illustrated by the circuitry inside the ALU. So that's why I, I can do a, J, a JZI right away. I don't need to compare. I can just do a JZI right away. 
if it is zero, if the bitwise and is zero, we go to the else case. If not, we go to the then case. Okay, so we basically say uh, v and m equals to zero go to else. So this is the then case, which is loading the 49 into whatever P is pointing to. So I put it into register A, and then we do the rest at uh, G ter end, which is uh, the ternary operator, or ternary expression end of G. The else case is also just as simple. We are loading 48, which is the ASCII code of zero, into register A instead of uh, 49 into register A. So by the time we get to G ter and register A has the right hand side of what we want to put into whatever P is pointing to. So what is rest, what is what else we need to do is to figure out um, where is P pointing to in C, which is uh, where is Q pointing to in assembly code. So B is the offset to Q. B is the address of Q. And B is now the value of Q, and that's what we want, that's the address. So we need to do a single store, so this way we basically say whatever Q is pointing to now gets whatever A has, which is the result of the result of the ternary expression, like so. So that will basically accomplish this particular line, okay? So the next line, makes use of B again, because B has not changed. Whatever B is pointing to has changed, but B is still the value of Q. So by implementing B, B is now Q plus one. And then what we do is we put a zero into A, okay? That's basically the same thing as clearing register A, which is uh, gonna be the value of the right-hand side. So now we uh, store to that location. So we basically are doing Q plus one, whatever location Q plus one is pointing to, which is one byte past uh, the one that's just stored the ASCII code of a zero or one. Now the next byte is going to store the no terminator. So this way, uh, every step along the way, I make sure that there is a no terminator, um, because you know I'm assuming that I'm the I'm writing to the last character, which may not be the case because after it returns, uh, the caller may decide to do something else. But you know, I made sure that if I were the last uh, doing, if I were to put a, the, the, a value into the last byte of the array, I make sure that there's a null terminator after that. Um, and then we decrement uh, B. Okay, so if B is uh, Q plus one at this point, by decrementing it, B is now just Q. Okay. And then we copy back to, to A, so A is also Q, and that's fine because that's what we want to return, as the, because the return value is supposed to be P, <coughs> which is Q in assembly code. So by doing a CPR AB you know, on line 116, um, that is now accomplished. And then the rest of this is just the uh, return statement to return back to the caller. And that's basically how the whole program is done, okay? Um, so just to let you know that there are eight errors in every single question, you know, so all variations of all the questions have exactly eight errors to fix. Um, they get sprinkled around, you know, depending on which one you get, you know, you, uh, the, uh, the combination of those eight errors can be different. Okay, but you can see that you know if there are eight out of twelve you know errors, there are a lot of overlap. Okay, if you look at any two uh, questions, there's a there's a pretty good overlap between um, the errors. Now, how much of an overlap are we looking at? So, if you um, perform the math, okay, so you say eight by eight. Okay, eight plus eight is sixteen, and sixteen minus twelve is four. So between any variations of the test, you know, four of the eight errors are going to be in common. The other four can be, you know, can be the same, okay? If you know, there are two tests, they're exactly the same. It can happen, um, or they can be very different, okay? But you can count on at least four errors to be exactly the same between any two versions of the test. All right. So I, I'm done with explaining the, um, the answer, and I can post 
um, at least one of the solutions on Discord if anyone is interested. Um, there are 648 variations of um, the key and for each key there are 12 choose 8 many um, variations depending on you know, what error is in included in in each question so there is a total of more than 32,000 uh, um, possible questions so that's why you know um, that's why each person each of you you know has your own key because you know if I just talk about the solution like what I'm doing now um, you may you may not be seeing exactly the same thing okay because the errors that you will see would not be the same as an, a, a, another person's and then and then the use of the registers are also different that's how I can generate um, so many different combinations because I also uh, make use of permutations this time of how I use the registers to hold temporary values throughout the execution of the program um, so that's how I can generate so many different variations of the same question, 30, more than 320,000 of them. All right, so um, that's the end of the probably the last recording of this entire summer session. And um, I am on my way to refine my tools for grading the exam because, you know, um, because I have to kind of ignore the comments that you guys added when I want to look at you know how many of the errors are actually corrected and how many no. non errors are quote unquote you know changed you know, in the code because that also uh, affects uh, the score so I have to basically strip all the comments out you know when I do one particular phase of the grading and then I have to look at the comment and when I'm performing another phase of the grading I want to look at the when I want to look at the rationale I want to read the comments okay I want to see you know how people explain and go like okay I need to change this line because blah 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 okay so I have to uh, make a tool so that I can look at the comments when I need to and not look at the comments when I don't need to for the same lines um, and that's but the tool that I'm continuing to work on right now uh, but I am, you know, doing that. It is in progress, so I'm hoping to get everything done within maybe one or two days um, from today. So maybe by Wednesday, I will have all the grades, you know, done. All right. So I'm gonna post this on YouTube, probably at the general channel, and then send an announcement through YouTube. And um, so have a good rest of the summer, and um, help you get all the classes that you want in the fall semester and uh, let's hope everybody can teach online remotely or teach remotely or online uh, so that you won't be impacted in terms of your learning at uh, the college. Alrighty, bye.